Welcome everybody to our seminar series today um, within the SDG Nexus network. So we are very delighted to have a, as guest speaker, Joshua Newell. I hope I pronounce your surname correctly. Otherwise, please correct me once you introduce yourself. He is associate professor in the School for Environment and Sustainability at the University of Michigan. And uh, we thought, or especially our one member, Vladimir Otrashenko, thought it might be a good idea to um, give the floor to you since you do quite some interesting research also related to the topics we are interested in. So thanks for being with us today. And um, you are going to talk about what if smart cities are not so smart. So just how it's working, we will have half an hour, so 30 minutes presentation. Um, and then we have time for another 30 minutes of discussion, which I will try to moderate. So we will have people listening here in WebEx and there is also live streaming via YouTube. So if uh, questions will come up there, um, Bjorn will let me know. So that's the framework. Um, so again, welcome everybody and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you, Ramona, for the kind introduction. I hope everyone can hear me okay. My my internet connection has been a little spotty, but we'll just hopefully not have any hiccups here. Um, so I understand that a number of you are focused on sort of this emerging discourse and research on smart cities. And so, at least according to Vladimir, uh, so I've decided that um, I pull up kind of a, a presentation um, that reflects on what is a smart city. Uh, it was some work, uh, some thinking I did a few years ago, but um, given the interest in this crowd, I thought I would revisit this. And it's not really research per se that I've done uh, today in today's presentation. I'm really going to be drawing on other people's research and ideas about smart cities. But it does get to the root of one of my concerns about smart the smart city research realm and discourses. Are we measuring the right things when we think about what it is to be a smart city? And here as a geographer, I'm thinking especially about the uh, extended impact of cities through resource consumption flows, and resource production flows to other places and spaces. And I think when we, um, as you'll see, my, my main argument today is really that um, we don't necessarily want to think by censoring a city within its boundaries, we may necessarily made it sustainable. Um, and so thinking through the connections of the city, of the urban to other places through resource consumption, I think it's going to be really important as we think about maybe smart city 2.0, if you will, kind of an advancement of, of thinking about these really interesting ideas about how we can combine technology, emerging technology to better understand how we use resources in our buildings and our transportation and our energy systems. So that's sort of the crux of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, sure I can advance this. Um, just to give everyone a little bit of background here is just one definition of a, a smart city. Um, and it's a designation given to a city that incorporates information and communication technologies, um, really to enhance the performance of urban services, specifically energy, transportation, utilities, and really with one of the key aims of reducing resource consumption. So we think about climate change, we think about the global sustainability imperative, obviously everything we can do uh, from a city perspective to reduce resource use is gonna be vital both in the present and moving forward. Um, and then there's also a component here, as you can see in the last part of the definition is really trying to make a smart city uh, so that it benefits the citizens who live in it, right? So we have smart technologies and it enhances the quality of life and well-being of its citizens. So that's sort of a, a classic definition of a smart city. Um, obviously, cities and sensors are emerging all over. Um, we're putting sensors on to better understand um, traffic congestion, transit patterns, parking, um, waste collection, water systems, um, and numerous cities are obviously uh, deploying these sensors in this graphic. You can just see some examples here. Cities like Montreal, Singapore, of course, many others. 
Um, and of course, cities are really engines of, of growth, right? And so um, approximately, uh, for example, just in the, the 100 biggest metro areas in the United States are responsible for about three quarters of the gross domestic product of the entire country, right? So we're talking about a huge economic impact of cities. They're really where most people are located now. Um, by 2030, up to six, uh, six out of 10 people in the world will live in cities. And this will increase to approximately seven out of 10 people by 2050. So obviously this is a really important place for action and thus the emergence of smart cities and specifically the use of, techno of sensors and other technologies to better capture and uh, manage the city in all its complexity. This is also big business. Um, by 2020, cities were already spending approximately $20 billion on new sensor technology. This is going to exp expand. And so many companies are getting involved in this space as well, which has become very active. IBM, a big international multinational, US-based multinational, um, has been doing a lot of work on, on smarter buildings uh, for a smarter planet using real-time measurements and algorithms and all sorts of complicated analytics to really manage, better manage um, building systems. That can be water, HVAC systems, pumps, all the rest of it. Um, and also to manage uh, resilience, right, in terms of, of being resilient to weather, different weather uh, uncertainties, energy prices, uh, which are particularly acute now, right, uh, and important. Um, and so this is just one example of smarter buildings and the role of the private sector really in emerging into this space. We also have smart energy systems, right, in cities. We have smart water systems. This is another graphic um, that's um, <clears throat> just providing an example of sort of this, this the interconnectedness between different systems. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here, but just energy is a crucial, a component of smart cities and energy management and how these relate to each other uh, is very interesting and very important, obviously. And also smart transportation systems, of course. Uh, at the University of Michigan, we have a very active autonomous vehicle, kind of um, smart, we call it M-City, but basically because, you know, Michigan is one of the centers of the automobile industry, in some ways like Germany, of course, we have a very vibrant research node at the University of Michigan focused on autonomous vehicles and smart transportation systems. So another area, of course, where we're seeing this emerge in the city landscape. And feel free to ask me questions if you want as we proceed. I'm happy to, um, to stop and answer any questions or clarifications. <clears throat> so here's my concern, is that when we start thinking about the smart city, it slowly becomes equal to or equatable with a sustainable city, right? And another way, uh, another concern might be thinking that the sustainable city is really a carbon smart city, if you will, right? Um, and so I'm going to delve into a little bit about, uh, about carbon accounting of the smart city, if you will, just to show some problematic aspects with that. And that leads into my argument about us really thinking to account for uh, consumption impacts elsewhere, and especially indirect or scope three uh, sort of emission sources. And so you'll see this in a minute. But here's an example of the carbon footprint from New York City. This was uh, done in 2014. It's a little dated. I just pulled this off the New York City uh, website, basically. Um, but it's a very narrow definition of the carbon footprint of New York. So it's basically just the buildings. Um, which would comprise about 75% of greenhouse gases for the entire city. Um, and then there's the transportation, right? And that is not all that the city is, right? We consume food in the city. We consume uh, services. We consume, um, you know, non-durable goods of all kinds, right? So this is just a really a small piece of it, right? But I think when we think about the smart city, it often devolves into smart transportation, and smart buildings, right? But there's so much more to that. And the danger here, of course, is if we build our system scope so that we just think about buildings and transportation, we're missing a whole lot. And we're really maybe not doing justice to the term sustainable city, at least in this sort of narrow sort of calculation. And if you think about scope emissions, so we have, of course, scope one emissions, which are direct emissions, right, of the company. 
This can be the vehicles that they own or the fuel that they combust on site. Scope two are uh, what we call indirect emissions. This is um, sort of the emissions associated with purchase electricity for the operation of that corporate facility, if you will, for taking the private sector as an example. And then there's this big bucket of scope three emissions, which are very can be very large and very hard to calculate. And so if we think about a city, it can be all kinds of things, which I just sort of alluded to previously. This can be food. This can be um, travel, right? Airplane travel is this can be a scope three emission. And we can think about this for a specific company, but we can also scale this up to think about it for a specific, uh, for a city, right? Um, product use, all sorts of outsourced activities, right? So these are huge buckets of emissions and emission sources that are increasingly becoming important uh, in accounting, right? So we have what we call the rise of consumption-based accounting, and this has been applied to cities. C40 is doing some really interesting accounting of this, really trying to capture all of these scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions of cities, or direct and indirect, where you can also hear the term direct and embedded. Um, C40 is an association of cities across the, the planet, um, and they've partnered with American Express to do a trials in two cities. I think it's London and New York. I'm not exactly sure, but American Express has a huge data uh, set, right, of all of these kind of expenditures of people. <laughs> and so I think this is sort of where we're headed in terms of thinking about what makes a sustainable city. And if we think about Smart City 2.0, I think this is probably where it needs to head in terms of really doing a full what we call consumption based accounting. Of, of cities and their functions. So this is a pretty famous study of the U.S. of the carbon footprint of a typical U.S. household. It was done in 2011, but it's still very germane, I think, to our discussion today. And in blue, those are those direct emissions that I was talking about, or those scope one emissions. And then the indirect emissions, which are often scope two and, of course, scope three, are in green. And you can see, like, for food, basically, all of our food, which is consumption, which is very substantial, right? It's at least according to this diagram, it's like half as much as all of our transportation, right? It could be even higher depending on how you account for it. That's all indirect emissions, right? That's all scope three, primarily scope three emissions, except for the cooking of that food at that site, right? Um, similarly with goods and similarly with uh, services, process, right? So we can think about this as entertainment, education, healthcare, all of these have sort of emissions profiles, right? Um, and so it's very important, and this is just sort of reemphasizing my point about really thinking through, okay, what uh, what is the footprint of a city, right? And we have to then account for these so-called indirect emissions. And I'll provide a few more examples here to make that clearer. So this is from a, the, a, the same study, and this is for the 28 largest cities in the United States. And it's broken down by color by the different sectors, right? So transportation, housing, food, goods, and services. It just shows basically what I showed before, but in a little bit more of a visual representation where you can compare across cities. And you can really see how big a component some of these indirect emissions are for these other uh, buckets, right? Um, and so really thinking through what, I, coming back to my original point about a smart city, if we're just going to do transportation and buildings, we're missing a huge chunk of this, right? And so thinking through how we do that and what ways we account for that and how we might even censor that stuff, right? Stuff that's coming from outside the city, <laughs> not so easy, but I think increasingly important. What kind of tracking technologies do we have? What kind of ways can we build linkages and networks to understand how things are produced elsewhere, under what conditions, what are the impacts? And thinking about how technology and communication services could play a role in tracking these, these resources into cities and out of cities. One of the big challenges with this, of course, is, it, is we haven't been able to effectively decouple income levels with the carbon footprints, right? So the larger your income or the bigger your income, generally the bigger your carbon footprint. We haven't been, really been very successful in decoupling this. Um, and as you can see on the bottom graph here, as your income goes up, your emissions go up, and that's particularly true for certain types of segments, right? So you can see here with water and waste use, uh, services, goods, air travel, right? All of that goes up 
those are indirect emissions really go up, especially. Whereas if you think about food and home energy, it's more inelastic, if you will. It's not, it, it doesn't vary as much um, as your incomes rise, right? But you really see this emergence of indirect emissions associated with income as, as you get well, as people get wealthier. And we don't have, don't have a sustainability got to come to terms with the role of income, how that's so tightly correlated with the footprint size. It's still a, a very naughty research question and problem that many people are working on, don't have easy solutions to. Uh, this graph is not so clear. This is an interesting paper by Daniel Moran, Environment Research Letters, that maps the, the size of cities. So this is 13,000 cities uh, by the carbon footprint of cities, or I'm sorry, the GDP of cities. And then the dark blue or purple are scope one emissions and the kind of the bigger blob, blobby blues are scope three emissions, right? And so if you look up at the upper right where you have large populations, so large, huge cities that are very wealthy, you can see the role of scope three emissions, right, in some of these cities. So it's really just another way to visualize kind of interesting ways, the role of scope three, how it is important and how it increases as incomes cities are, are wealthier. Here's just another kind of visualization of that. Uh, on the bottom axis, you have population of, of various cities, right? So you have Seoul, New York, Los Angeles, Shanghai, Dong, I think that's the last one. Can't see because of the, yeah, Guangzhou. Um, and then you have the footprint size, right? And you can see that that goes up basically as, um, well, it, it doesn't necessarily go up with the size of the city, but obviously the higher income cities have higher footprints, New York, Los Angeles, Singapore, and so on and so forth. This is from Daniel Moran. So the question then that I kind of left you with is how can we decouple income levels uh, from carbon footprints or can we? I think that's a big, big research question. Happy to talk about that. In the, in the session. I don't have any easy answers for this, unfortunately. Um, but the second piece of my question and, and what I want to focus on is, are we measuring the right things, right? So just getting back to my argument here again, cities are nodes of consumption, right? We consume, we are approximately 3% of the terrestrial surface of the planet, but we're responsible for three quarters of the greenhouse gas emissions through the things that we consume, right? So we affect places and people all over the planet. And so when we think about what, us, what how do, I think it's important to think about what we mean by urban, right? So how does a smart city, a smart city research, if you pick it up, how does it conceptualize the urban? Is it just the city boundary itself? Or are we looking at something more multi-scalar, right? That cuts across different places um, over time, right? So this is just one image of how I think about urban areas or urban systems. This is from a paper I did with some PhD students of, um, six years ago now on defining urban resilience, right? So this is how we think about the components of a, a resilient urban place. Um, you could use this diagram for urban sustainability. You could use this diagram for the urban metabolism if you want. But basically there's four planes here that interact in complex ways. In the middle two planes you have kind of material and energy flows. This can be energy flows, food flows, water flows, materials, uh, waste, right? And these obviously link across scales, not just within the city themselves, they interact with each other. And then you have urban infrastructure and form. So you have form and flow, if you will, right? So in terms of form, we have transportation form, we have building form, we have utilities, we have green space, right? For one of a lack of a better term, just of green, um, green, green form in the city, if you will. Um, these interact together, form and flow, and are shaped by socioeconomic dynamics, right? And in, in turn, shape socioeconomic dynamics on the bottom plane. This is the demographics of the city, the equity issues of the city, capital, mobility. And then at the top, of course, you have governance networks, states, labor, industry, consumers, NGOs, all of these interact. Um, this is how I think of the urban. All of these interact in complex ways. And importantly, for our discussion here, they obviously link to other places and oper operate across scales. Um, 
And I think a big challenge with urban research generally, and this is a, a criticism that's in urban studies, basically, that urban research has what we call methodological cityism. Right. So even if you theorize the city to be connected to other places and the city is an open system and it links to rural areas and so on and so forth through resources, capital flows, when it gets down to it empirically, we're not still not very good at, at, at doing research that stretches beyond a very place based bounded sense of the city. Right. So in urban studies, there's been a a big push to try to understand cities as 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 planetary spaces, right? That connect to all, in effect, all just all places all over the world, um, and trying methodologically and empirically to do that, and that's not so easy, right? And so, if we think about the smart city and uh, trying to censor, <clears throat> you know, water infrastructure from outside the city, right? Those kinds of things, it's possible, not so easy. Very important, and I think increasingly an important focus when we need to start thinking about and defining a smart city, a sustainable city, a resilient city, and so on and so forth. And then thinking, as I was sort of alluding to, how can a smart city heal what we can, what I call this metabolic rift? So this is sort of the spaces of consumption in cities, right? Uh, shopping centers, our houses, uh, buildings, right? These are areas where we consume and then spaces of production, where that stuff comes from, right? There's a disconnect between that. And I think part of our challenge when we think about sustainability is really connecting these two places together in meaningful ways and then getting back to the possibilities of technology and communication infrastructure. Um, there are some interesting possibilities and some interesting emerging sort of approaches. And just to get more concrete, I can give you one example of sort of one resource that stretches beyond the city where I think um, has potential to kind of understand and explore some of these dimensions. And that's, of course, water supply infrastructure, which is more spatially bounded than a global commodity like fertilizer or something like that, right? Because you've got infrastructure that links the urban to the rural. Um, and so you can, I think, start to get at some of this metering, censoring, tracking, mapping, of water, right, to and from the city. And that's an interesting way to kind of move beyond the methodological cityism that I was talking about, trying to kind of get to come to terms with, with these origins. And we've done some work on Los Angeles doing this, kind of trying to map these flows and doing a carbon footprint of these flows, right? So trying to divide sort of by the different water sources. So just step back here a little bit. Los Angeles has like four or five major water sources um, from the northern part of, of California, which is really energy intensive, a state water project. Just looking and seeing how my time is here. Um, got six minutes. Um, and then you've got the Los Angeles Aqueduct, which is gravity fed. Then you have the Colorado River Aqueduct, which is increasingly challenging to get water, right? And then you have local sources, right? So we did a study calculating the carbon footprint of these various sources. Um, this is just the breakdown of kind of the, the imported sources versus the local sources. And then we calculated the carbon footprint of these various sources using life cycle assessment. Um, and just, and then in addition to that, then we did social science, sort of more traditional social science research where we did interviews and ethnographic studies to kind of document some of the environmental justice dimensions of these flows, right, of these water supply sources. And it turns out there's a long history of kind of contested sort of injustice associated with sort of the development of these sort of aqueducts and things like that, this infrastructure that's really problematic and persists to this day. So really trying to take kind of a holistic way of th thinking about sustainability beyond just calculating the carbon footprint, but thinking about the environmental justice and equity dimensions of these various supply sources as we think through how to make a city smarter and, and more sustainable. That's just one example of a resource flow. Um, I think that it could be done, obviously, with sensors and all sorts of, you know, techniques, technologies that, you know, is so vibrant in the smart city world and deployed specifically for things like water. And ultimately, sort of just a kind of an abstract call for thinking about building an ethic of distance as we think through global sustainability and we think through the rise of cities and our, our, all of us, many of us living in urban areas, 
really trying to come to terms with building more of a nuanced ethic of distance where we are connected to places from elsewhere and are attentive to those sustainability dimensions, those justice dimensions. I think this is a big challenge moving forward. When we think about sustainable cities, you know, can we have global resource flows for our cities? I think that's an open question at this point because it's so challenging um, to track these things. They shift all the time. And maybe we should start thinking about like a revalorization of sort of regional, city regional um, sustainability where we actually shrink the, the extent of some of these cities in terms of where resources come from. And then that way we might be able to get a better foothold on, um, you know, making cities smarter and more sustainable, if you will. So I, that's just sort of how my thinking's been evolving. You know, we have this these globalization debates now. We have thinking about anti-globalization. We have challenges with wars and where fertilizer comes from and wheat and all this. And it gets me thinking again that maybe we should think about building city regions. Like we used to think about cities as city and contiguous hinterlands and thinking about regional regional sustainability in that sense. So that's just, I thought I'd end with that today. Happy to take questions. We can have a discussion. And thank you for your time. Okay. Uh, thanks for your presentation, first of all. And yes, I assume there is now a discussion. I already saw some questions in the chat, okay. so the floor is open. Um, I think there was one question post on YouTube related to the slide you showed um, with these. So which of these three scopes produce the most of CO2 emissions? I think it was the one with the blue bubbles, the slide. Uh, okay. Yeah, um, it varies, right? Um, it's an interesting study in the relationship between size and scope emissions, right? And 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 gross domestic product, right? So you can see here that the dark purple, you have a lot of cities between like 100,000 and, and a million that are fairly low in terms of GDP, right? So lower income cities of this size, where most of the the footprint is scope one emissions, right? But as you start getting up to higher income cities like here, right? These are higher income cities of the same size, you have more uh, of an influence of scope three emissions. So more sort of indirect consumption associated with kind of higher income levels. And the same is true here of mega city, as you can see up here, not always, right? There are some examples, but generally you see a trend here um, where you have sort of the scope three emissions become the bigger blobs than the purple cores, if you will. It's an interesting paper, um, too. I encourage you all to have a look at it. I, I put the Dan okay. Moran, you can Google mm -hmm. Scholar, and there's a link here. Too. Okay. And I just see in the slide, so uh, in the chat, I think it was related to the slide number 11, I see now. So if you maybe just okay. see your slide number 11. Yeah, this one. And this is from Jones and Kamen's paper. Okay. Mm -hmm. That breaks down the footprint of a typical house U.S. household in terms of um, direct emissions, which are in blue, and then, of course, the green emissions, which are indirect. These indirects can include scope two and scope three emissions. Okay. Um, I hope this answer the question, otherwise feel free and also the others raise your hand. I would like to pose a question. Actually, if I look at this slide, I mean, I fully agree. You said there's more than transportation and housing to get, uh, I mean, to come to a sustainable city. But I would argue the other okay. way around, at least if we would get transportation and housing already climate or carbon yeah. smart, I mean, we would already make a large step, wouldn't we? Of course, we can always say we need to do more, but looking at this, if at least we would get this right, um, what's your take on this? Of course, I fully see, uh, agree, yes. I think we all agree, but we need to step by step, right? So what would be the priority? And right. looking at this slide, I would say, yeah, why not prioritize transportation and housing? Um, Yes, and many and many do. I, I think that, and I, there, I don't think there's a problem with that. I think the danger becomes when we when we start seeing things like New York City equating their footprint entirely, this example, to um, 
to those two sectors, right? So that's to me the danger, I think. So just being cognizant and being honest about what portion of that percentage you're actually dealing with and not trying to, so the danger is, is that people tend to associate sustainable cities with just those two sectors. And then it becomes uh, us feeling like we've done great work, but then we've got this naughty problem of beef consumption, right? The elephant, the cow in the room, if you will, which is responsible for approximately 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And, you know, we consume that in cities. And so I think just being clear that, okay, we're deal we're talking about, you know, 40% of the footprint of cities is what transportation and housing, if that's what it is, right? I think approaches like consumption-based accounting, GHG accounting can give us a pretty good handle on what that percentage is. I just think being cognizant of that and being upfront about that's important. I feel, I guess the danger for me is when it gets translated into city planning agencies and sustainability offices in cities, it gets equated with that only, and that's the danger. And then people feel like, they, you know, that's, we're, we're, we're fine and, and we're not, so. Okay, okay, thanks, yeah. Um, Vladimir? Yeah, thank you, Joshua, for the interesting presentation. Yeah. Um, my question related to more social economic perspective. So I have talked with several uh, German urbanists and what they actually do here is that uh, mixing the building of low income people with a high income people. So you can see the fancy build, fancy houses at the same time in, 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 neighbor, in a neighborhood, you can find these uh, 12 floor uh, buildings. Do you think which approach like seg full segregation or mixing them, which approach produce less uh, footprint in this case? Footprint or gentrification effects? Yeah. So they're di very, very different. I, um, I don't know that answer. That's an interesting question. I think there's been a lot of attempts to, you know, to, to try to create affordable housing in the United States and elsewhere, right? And try to mix income levels within, within neighborhoods and within even buildings. Um, I think it's a big challenge. I don't know the answer in terms of like what's better for a carbon footprint perspective. That's an, actually an interesting question. Um, it would be, you know, it's difficult maybe to set up, but I think it could be really interesting in terms of the impact. Yeah, uh, thank you. We have not solved the affordable housing problem at all. I don't know about in Germany, but in the US it's a huge issue um, and very much a problem that's associated with a smart city too, or a sustainable city is how do we provide affordable housing for people that can't afford to spend $2 million for a house in Los Angeles, right? And don't want to have to drive two hours to get to work. And uh, it's just a big, a big, big issue. And there's a number of strategies for that, um, which we could talk about. But I, I, I think it's still, a, especially with the rapid increase recently in real estate prices in the US and elsewhere, uh, even a more acute problem. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Okay. Are there questions? Um, I was wondering, since, I mean, uh, many of us come more from like agriculture food systems and uh, in this uh, uh, rim, because you spoke about linking consumption and production once again, as far as I understood, which is actually a hot topic in terms of urban farming, vertical farming, and so forth. So is this right. what you have in mind or where, where there is potential? Yeah, that's a great question. So I have a couple big projects on urban agriculture. Um, we're not doing vertical, looking at vertical, the efficiencies of vertical farming. We're looking at allotment gardens in Europe and uh, community gardens in the U.S. And we're using life, so we've been using life cycle assessment to quantify the environmental performance in terms of resource usage of water, energy, fertilizer, uh, of production of produce, mostly fruits and vegetables. Um, and it, it turns out our initial calculations are that it doesn't compare very favorably, that the environmental footprint or the carbon footprint of community garden produce fruits and veg is, is much is higher than conventional agriculture. Um, 
because I, of the I, scale, I because of the scale, or what's the major the, the economies of scale yeah. primarily? Okay. Yeah, the efficiencies of it. But we're learning. We've kind of done a more of a holistic assessment. We're learning that a lot of the motivation for it is actually community cohesion, social fabric, uh, public awareness of of nutrition, well being, feelings of well community well being, all things that probably should be quantified in some ways. But um, so those are some of the big motivations for this. Um, so in terms of feeding the city, at least with community gardens and allotment gardens, probably it may be possible in some cities with high land availability, like Detroit, for example, or even places in Eastern Europe, potentially, that are shrinking. But I don't think from an environmental perspective, it's probably a good idea just because of the footprint uh, per, you know, per unit produced. Um, there's all sorts of other social reasons for it. So given that, I'm sort of of the mind that and I'm not talking about vertical gardens or hydroponics and, you know, some of those emerging technologies. I, I my understanding is that hydroponic, you know, it's very energy intensive. Some of that type of gardening, especially in northern climates. Now that will shift with grid mixes, like, you know, we clean up our grid mixes and we can, you know, produce it with solar power and wind power that those, those energy intense tomatoes, if you will. But my sense is, is that we think about at least in the States uh, building urban rural linkages through our food systems and regionalizing those food systems and doing that in ways that's more humane for animals and for the planet. Um, so we just did a big study on sort of the environmental costs of beef production in the Central Valley of California and sort of documenting the health impacts, the PM 2.5 impacts associated with concentrated animal feeding operations or feedlots and some of those you know, animal welfare issues. and just the sheer impact of beef, you know, in terms of its greenhouse gas emissions impacts and stuff. So we, we did this sort of uh, like assessment. And for me, thinking about the future of food systems, I think really thinking about building again, back to my city regional idea where you can build connections to rural regions outside the urban core and build like peri-urban is popular term in Europe, thinking about ways we can do that and build more humane sort of sustainable, resilient food systems that way and revisiting our sort of industrialization of, agri of, 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 of beef production, meat production in particular. So that's sort of how we've been thinking about food, thinking about building those regional kind of spaces, moving away from globalized food systems, um, kind of as a, as a pathway forward. Okay. So one more question, maybe because you had like smart city equals sustainable city or with a question yeah. mark. And now you you also stressed uh, if we speak about potential ways quite a lot, the environmental perspective, right? Because you said maybe from a social perspective, this community gardens might be actually a good solution. Right. I mean, then we are again in the discussion, okay, trade off, how do we, right. I mean, do you work on anything like how do we trade off the different goals in terms of uh, social equity, you had to also environmental justice versus, okay, maybe their emissions are higher there. So any sure. thoughts on this? It's, I mean, I have, we have thoughts about it. And, and I think the challenge is how do you build a framework that uh, accurately sort of balances those trade-offs? Certainly one way to do that is an ecosystem service framework where you, where sort of uh, community welfare and well-being become cultural ecosystem services and um, food production is a provisioning ecosystem service, right? And you can think about that as a potential framework to look at balances and costs. You can also do a life cycle sustainability assessment framework. I think for some cultural services and sort of social benefit services that 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 methodology is still pretty rudimentary. Um, it's much better for quantifying environmental impacts and comparing it to like conventional agriculture. So the challenge becomes how do you meaningful integrate these and understand trade-offs uh, when you have very different kind of accounting systems, if you will, for this, and how do you do it meaningfully? Some people are of the mind that you can't combine these in a quantitative framework that you have to like actually describe the qualitative benefits and then quantitative benefits and plop it all into a big assessment. Others say, no, you can do, do that as well. I think it's a really rich area of research and gets to sort of some of the trade-offs associated with environmental sustainability as you're alluding to versus social sustainability. 
one way we've been thinking about this is thinking about like scaling up certain types of things in cities. So scaling up production of community gardens or scaling up community gardens. Where might we site these things in strategic locations that provide multiple benefits? So we use spatial multi-criteria evaluation to basically layer these benefits. And then we can stakeholders can weight these benefits based on what they think are the most important ones. So we've done this a lot for green infrastructure. I don't know if you've heard this term, probably have. But green infrastructure can be anything from bioswales to a, a park. Uh, and its pr premier sort of driver, primary driver in the US has been abating stormwater. Uh, and that is driven by water quality regulations, right, from the US CPA. Um, and we've been trying to develop ways that we could abate stormwater by siting green infrastructure, but also choosing strategic locations, maybe where there's park poverty, maybe where there's high levels of social vulnerability. And we can develop hotspots like at the parcel scale or at the census tract scale and say, okay, we acknowledge that you know you can abate stormwater here at these particular locations. Well, are there other locations where we can also synergize other benefits, right? Um, such as social alleviating social vulnerability or reducing park poverty. Um, are there ways that we can balance these and, and look for uh, synergies and trade offs too? It's a nice way. Spatial multi criteria evaluation is a nice way to spatial planning is a nice way to kind of look at trade offs at, at the spatial scale, you know, between these various services, if you will. So that's one way. Those are a couple of different ways to think about balancing these different sort of pillars, if you will, of sustainability and do like a life cycle sustainability assessment approach. You can do uh, um, sort of spatial trade offs using spatial multi criteria evaluation and using ecosystem service framework, for example. So there's a lot of different interesting ways to think about these, but the, the trade-offs are real and it comes down to, in some ways, what people want, right? And so how do you incorporate community and stakeholder needs, in addition to sort of some of the environmental imperatives as well? Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah. Not mm -hmm. easy, but a lot of different approaches, sure, and how to figure out. So I think there is yeah. I know, another, no, there is a, just you oh, wow. posted something just... about uh, registration. Further questions or remarks from the audience? Yeah. I was wondering, okay, I will just go on if nobody... <laughs> I was wondering in terms of, because you mentioned this, okay, Los Angeles, if people need to travel a long way and so forth. I mean, how do you assess this impact of remote working? Well, I don't know the answer to this question. I think it's a fascinating question and it has lots of implications for transportation and building energy and, you know, smart cities. I, I did see on Twitter an interesting paper that just came out by the National Bureau of Economic Research that estimated that in the United States, I think up to 40 or 50% of the increase in housing values was basically driven by remote work. And that's really interesting. And um, I don't know how they did that. It was a, it's an a study by a group of economists. It'd be worth digging into. Um, and it'd be worth digging into to see if it's wealthy people actually buying second homes and, um, you know, working partially in one place and partially in another. But um, that's interesting. And I think from a sustainability viewpoint, if we are going to um, not live in cities as much and maybe live in suburban areas and maybe live in big single family houses, that has all kinds of resource use implications, mostly to the negative for environmental sustainability. So you do have maybe transportation benefits but if people are building big, sprawling single family houses, you know, in the exurban areas and suburban areas outside of urban cores in the US, that's not a very smart business or model for sustainability. You know, that's more of a sprawl model, which, um, you know, is not like living in high density multifamily housing in, a, in an urban core. So it scares me, to be honest. But Even I think the there's urban a scroll mod yeah. Okay, but Vladimir, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so regarding this housing, there is also maybe we'll have talk already during our dinner. There is also discussion in the German society to start building these single houses. 
-hmm. in the future. Preliminary discussion will be like uh, 2025. So which uh -huh. means that there will be no any more single houses. So I knew that sooner or later it will happen. It must happen. So my idea is just should we buy houses right now? Because the value <laughs> will be tremendously huge after introduction such uh, such regulation. And there is a quite yeah. simple reason. Population is growing and the land land is fixed. Right. And you need to allocate. And people want point. second homes too. I mean, you have a, a house in this apartment and or in the city where you maybe go you commute, you go into work three times a week, and then you have a place in the country, right? So. So we need to talk with government regarding remote working and make it um, business as usual. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think it's a great. A series of great research questions. So like, what will be the sustainability impacts of remote work, like from various angles? Yeah, I'm important to calculate. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, and then there is one question from you or from somebody who is watching on YouTube. Um, so I was wondering whether if there is an approach to induce special foods like insects in order to reduce CO2 emission when it comes to meat production by obtaining protein-based foods. Huh. Um, there's, I mean, there's interesting work on the life cycle assessment of like plant-based burgers versus beef-based burgers and insect, eating insects versus eating beef. I think probably, um, not my field, but I think important um, as we move forward and we think about the impacts of beef globally on the, on the planet. Okay, further questions or remarks? If this is not the case, um, I just will have a look one more time. I don't think that's not the case. Um, Thanks a lot for being yeah. with us today, for giving the presentation, also discussion. Looking forward maybe to see future work here together with some colleagues and um, yeah, having, or what time is it now in your case? So you are right now. I'm in, I'm in Germany. Ah, you're in Germany anyway. Okay. I'm right. <laughs> I'm okay. You, you are in Germany. Time, so. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So. Then. Okay, then nice afternoon to everybody. Then you will also yeah. maybe have the same nice weather. So, um, yeah. okay, same or nice afternoon. And um, to the ones who are interested, we will see each other on the 16th of June for the next seminar okay. on um, Thank you so much. citizen yeah. science. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah.